you know, when I was in college, I could stay up all night long, most of the night. I could yeah. drink, I could whatever, and then I'd train the next day. And I'm yeah. like, now, like, <laughs> I don't sleep, I drink. I'm like, I can't fucking train at all. No. <laughs> I don't know how you, uh, how you handle that, but I'm just kidding. I know exactly <laughs> yeah, how you handle that. <laughs> You're listening to Barbell Logic, brought to you by Barbell Logic Online Coaching, where each week we take a systematic walk through strength training and the refining power of voluntary hardship. Welcome to the Barbell Logic Podcast. This is Matt Reynolds. I'm here with Nikki, as usual. And I don't know if you've heard, but the world has essentially closed down since March. He, wait, what? And it's just, <laughs> it's true. It's true. It's a true story. And it's just starting to open up. And we have one of our amazing coaches, Mac McGregor. Yes. In Scotland. Who's going to do like a training camp. Yeah. So coming up. it took him a long time to be able to open his gym back up. And he has a gym called Capricorn Fitness. He's in Scotland. And he posted pictures to his Instagram of them cleaning their gym. And it was amazing. It was like NASA level cleaning. Yeah. <laughs> so they're really excited <laughs> to be able to open again. They're hosting um, what he's calling an all in lifting camp on Saturday, the 24th of October. And that just means he's going to go over all four lifts. And it's a really small group. There's only three spaces open, which means it's going to be nice and intimate. Weird way to say that, but it means that it's going to be very personal <laughs> and you'll get to go through all four <laughs> lifts. So if you've just been like lifting in your cave and haven't had anybody look at your lifts, probably a good idea to go get them checked out. And Mac is an amazing coach. He is, well, everybody in Scotland sounds the same, but if you're an American getting coached by Mac, it's awesome. <laughs> it's great. It's, it's like great. being in Braveheart. I love, I love listening to the guy. Yeah. That's right. So you can go to the events page on barbellogic.com yes. and you can find the link there to sign up for that training camp. Yep. It should be fun. October 24th. Cool. And a side note, we're working on just a little teaser. We're mm. working on a little bit too, mm-hmm. trying to set up our next couple. We're trying to do it, you know, very carefully and responsibly and figure out where the locations are going to be for both the, the next, uh, just a fun lifting seminar as well as the next PPC yeah. seminar. And so stay tuned. Those should come out very soon. We're honing in there. Yeah, that's exciting. So Matt, do you have any fun stories to get us started with? <laughs> as you'll recall our last conversation we had the uh melatonin vape story i have been keeping this sort of list on my notepad on my iphone for the last couple of weeks i have like 17 stories that are ridiculous you lead a very uh, but exciting this is the one life. i'm going to tell you today it's so bizarre it's uh it's essentially i'm george costanza is really what it is there's i just have things like happen to me like george costanza so Rachel's parents probably 10 years ago bought a hot tub and they use it for a little while. Then they kind of stopped using it and they've taken the kind of people take really good care of everything. And so they've been asking us for a couple of years, like, do you want our hot tub? And I'm, you know, like, yeah, but it's just, it's, it's not like a, you know, it's not like getting a chair. (laughs) It's a kind of a big ordeal. And so I've been kind of pressuring a little bit because I think they want to rebuild their deck and stuff in the backyard. So, okay. So, so we decide, yes, let's do it. We get a bid from a contractor to pour concrete slab and stuff in our backyard and build our deck around it. And then of course we have to move it. Well, an empty hot tub is about 800 pounds and it's, you know, it's seven feet by seven feet. It's good size. And so it's not an easy thing to move. So we've got to hire professional movers to move the thing. So we had professional movers move us a year and a half ago and moved into the new house. They did a really good job. Movers are, and first, if you're listening and you're a mover, I apologize for what I'm about to say, but they're sort of like carnies. (laughs) I feel like there's a lot of crystal meth smoking that goes on with movers, uh, at least in the Springfield, Missouri area. And so I have interviewed a handful of them, (laughs) and these are not the sort of people you would want to take your daughter out on a date. Mm. They're rough. They're rough guys. (laughs) And, uh, And so this company that I chose were a little less rough than some of the other companies and uh, and they did a good job moving us and moving our house and so okay so i set up this they're supposed to move the hot tub and they're like you know hey we're pretty booked out for the next several weeks but we think we can get it as early as saturday and as late as tuesday and so we'll call you let you know you know later on this week as we get closer okay no problem no phone calls 
I text, I call, ghost me, don't answer the phone. What the hell? I'm like, what is going on? Nobody answers the phone. And so then on Thursday of the following week, it doesn't get delivered on Saturday or Sunday or Monday or Tuesday. On Thursday of the following week, I call, they finally answer. And I'm like, hey, you were supposed to move a hot tub for me. And they're like, oh, um, yeah, what's your name again? And I was like, oh, my God, like, oh, God. people are awful and customer service is terrible everywhere. You know, and then the guy's like, oh, you know, I had a funeral to go to. And then I'm like, well, what can you say to that? You know, yeah, I don't even know if he's being honest. You just <laughs> kind of came out later. But what are you <sighs> supposed to say? You know, like, so, well, I'm sorry for your loss. And he's like, um, yeah, we'll, we'll go ahead and get you on the calendar. When would you like that delivered? I said, uh, between last Saturday and last Tuesday, when you told me you were going to deliver it. <laughs> and so that wasn't like a dick, but I was just like, you know, as soon as possible, because yeah. I thought it was getting delivered last week. Mm -hmm. And so he's like, all right, you know, Wednesday, we can deliver it. 11 a.m. Wednesday. Okay. Got it. So Wednesdays, as you know, at Barbell Logic, pretty Oof. busy. Lots Wednesdays of meetings. We have lots of Zoom calls on, meet on Wednesdays or notes. Yeah. And so I'm here and professional movers, professional truck. This hot tub is going from a concrete slab at my mother and father-in-law's house 15 minutes away to a concrete slab at my house. Seems pretty simple. So I'm like, well, I don't have time to go out there. They're going to pick it up and I'll be here and kind of make sure they get it in place here. And so I am on, <laughs> I'm on a, I happen to be on like a business sales call with a CEO of a pretty big company who's mm. looking at potentially bringing block on for his employees. And my phone starts going nuts oh, and it's no. my mother-in-law who never calls me and oh, i was God. like great you know and uh so i get up finally off the call and i try to figure out so the movers have stood up this hot tub on its edge and cartwheeled it down across the entire yard on the side of the hot tub no to get it into the truck and then when they get to the truck there's three guys there they can't get it in it's too heavy to get so i have to call three more guys in while it sits on its edge oh, as God. opposed to you know having some straps and putting it underneath the hot tub and picking it up and keeping it you know right side up so and then i have another business meeting with uh actually in town with somebody in uh, springfield and I tell my wife, I'm like, hey, I know this is sort of out of your comfort zone, but I need you to sort of manage this hot tub situation. I've got these super important meetings that I cannot break today. And uh, she's like, okay, I'll, you know, I'll do the best I can. So anyway, I go to the meeting, I come home, open up my garage door, and there's a hot tub standing on its <laughs> side where I'm supposed to park. Not on the slab in my backyard that's sitting there. And I'm like, oh my God. And the frame to the thing is, you know, busted up and not in great shape, mm -hmm. which is why my wife made the call. You can't put it on the concrete slab. We now have to rebuild the frame to this hot tub. And God knows if the, like the fiberglass inside the hot tub and stuff has been cracked. It probably has. Yeah. So, because I needed another project to do, we had to rebuild the frame <laughs> of the hot tub. And now I have an 880 pound hot tub standing on its side in my garage. And I'm like, how do you move an 880 pound hot tub? It took six professional movers to yeah. move it. Guess what we did? Rachel and I went to a hardware store and we bought three eight foot long, four inch diameter PVC pipes. And we oh, lowered the hot it. tub on the PVC pipes, which, by the way, was very difficult because that's real heavy to lower. And then we rolled it on the PVC pipes right side uh -huh. up. Right. So three PVC pipes would be yeah. on two. The third one would come out. We take my kiddos would take it out the back, bring it to the front, put it on and we roll it across. It only took about 12 minutes and we got it right on the concrete slab. Perfect. Super and that's a perfectly built base. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. So the moving company hasn't invoiced me yet. But when they do. They got, we got a talking to coming. It sounds like you should invoice them. <laughs> I know, right? I want to be like, are you, you literally cartwheeled it down. <sighs> I hired so some movers once to move me out of my apartment and they, I had this really nice mattress and only one person showed up and I have requested more people show up, but it was just like one dude showed up and he like, right. I had this narrow entryway. This was when I was living in San Francisco and this like $3,000 mattress. He did the same king size. He had it on its side and he just cartwheeled it down my alleyway yeah. and then up some stairs. I'm just like, Oh my God, please stop. Like the only thing yeah, that like I want to move across the country with me. Like yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right. By the way, yeah. how would you like to be in the $3,000 
mattress business these days when mattresses only cost $300 now. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. You notice that? Yeah. It's bizarre. Like it's China's like, oh, we're going to get in this business. And all well, of a sudden mattresses are 10. I remember when you when I first got married, I was like, oh, we can't buy a mattress. Like we can't. That's a we big can, thing. That's, a, that's what a car. That's what a car costs. You know, I think it's then, the same yeah, companies. Know, eight, eight years ago. I think it's the same companies make the $3,000 ones and they make the $300 ones. And it's the same mattress. Yes. Uh, yes. Although there are still some $3,000 mattresses that you can get for the boomers who don't know better. Mm hmm. But in another 10 years, those won't exist because everybody, our generations figured out, well, you can just go on to Amazon and buy a mm -hmm. super nice memory foam mattress for 300 bucks. And so we yep. bought all new mattresses for anyway. So that's my, just so you know, there are 16 more stories, almost identical <laughs> to like just as bad and just as ridiculous that I'll just, you know, we'll just tell one every it podcast. It sounds like we have a, a new while, series idea. <laughs> I know. <laughs> yeah. Ridiculous <laughs> life stories with Matt Reynolds. <laughs> so what are we talking about today? Okay. So popped in my head that we could talk about ways that you could be sabotaging your own training. Maybe you don't even know about it, but it's little things that you're doing. Maybe little habits you've picked up, ways that you're holding yourself back. Because you and I have had a lot of experience. I know with myself, I probably sabotaged my own training. And then we have, between the two of us, just coached thousands and thousands of, of clients. So we see little things that yeah. people do that end up sabotaging their own progress. So I think we're going to go, we have like, we each, Matt and I each have our lists ready. So we're going to kind of go back and forth. I bet there will be some similarities. Yep, we're going to play a little sabotage tennis here. Yeah. <laughs> but I thought it might be a good idea to start with defining what they're sabotaging themselves from accomplishing. So kind of defining what successful training is. And that might look a little bit yeah. different from person to person, but what is successful training? Sure. What's your definition of that, Matt? I think if I narrowed it down to the simplest definition, it would be that session by session or week by week, you are consistently moving towards the goal. So mm -hmm. if the goal is to get stronger, which for most of our people it is, but not for everybody, but if that's the primary goal, then you are consistently setting PRs. That doesn't mean that you don't have a bad day or a couple bad days or have some fatigue built up. And we can talk about some of those even later in the podcast. But if you look over time, week to week, month to month, you are clearly moving in the direction of progressing towards your goal, mm -hmm. whatever that goal is. Mm -hmm. I think that's successful training. I think as long as if the goal is to get stronger and you're able to keep putting weight on the bar, then you're fine. Mm -hmm. Right. And there may be some things that you can still continue to fix and clean up and make better progress. But I think in general, if that's what you're doing, then you're doing just fine. But if you're at this point where you're like, man, I'm really struggling to hit PRs or I'm really struggling to reach the goal. I'm really struggling to maybe your goal is to lose four inches off your waist and it's not coming off. Like at some point you have to go, what am I doing to sabotage the goal? Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's the way I look at it. What about yeah. You? I'd say successful training is something where you are driving progress, exactly what you just said. It could be all the different ways that we can achieve PRs. And also it's still adding value to your life. Like there might be, you know, just acute days where you're just like, ah, oh, I hate training. I really don't want to do this set of squats. But like on the larger scale, it's keeping you strong so that you have more muscle on your skeleton. It's giving you a habit that you regularly perform that leads to something bigger. And I think sometimes that's missing in people's lives, big or small. It's just like you need like some things that every little thing you do leads to something bigger that adds value. Yeah, that's good. Gosh, that emotional side of adding value is such a huge piece to what we do. I can remember, I remember the first time I really saw this when I owned Strong and we had a really good group of power lifters who were you know, in the powerlifting world, there's not really much money. But if there was such a thing as professional powerlifters, these guys were it. Mm. And it wasn't me. Mm -hmm. I mean, this was, these were all guys that squatted over a thousand. These were like, I mean, really strong guys. And I watched them train and nine months out of the year, it appeared that they absolutely hated training. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. Because they approached it like a job. Yeah. Training was a job for them. You yeah. Know? And I remember thinking to myself, I don't, want to do that. I don't remember ever feeling that way when I was when I was a professional strongman. I liked to train. I mm -hmm. always loved training. Now, I've had times in my life where I'm like I don't like the style of this training like I mm. you know, I was doing DUP and getting really strong, but I was also like I hate this. 
Uh, so I have had times like that, but for the most part, I enjoy training. Yeah. And I enjoy what it gets me. I enjoy the way it makes me feel. So you're exactly right. You want to be able to make progress towards the goal, but you also want it to bring your life value. Mm -hmm. That's successful training. Yeah. So, so what is, you want think, me to go first? I think you we're doing first? the same thing. You go first. Yeah. We're about to try to, okay. <laughs> so I'm going to start with the easiest one. Okay. So if I'm considering, if we're, because obviously the goal matters, but let's say for the vast majority of people, the goal is to get stronger. Mm -hmm. I think the first place you have to look is you have to make sure you're getting enough calories mm -hmm. in order to get stronger. So if you are, we have lots of people that actually try to mix those goals, right? They're like, I want to get stronger, but I also want to lose six inches off my waist. Mm -hmm. But those are at odds with each other. They might not be the first two weeks or the first month or maybe even the first six weeks, but you are going to bonk at some point. So you have to make sure you get your calories. I want to be very clear there, you know, our community and, and this sort of niche has developed a bad reputation, not necessarily at Barbell Logic for just like making people fat. <laughs> we don't want you to get fat. No, That's a bad deal. Right? right. But at the same time, if you're not getting enough calories to fuel the sessions and repair, mm -hmm. you are sabotaging your training. Yeah. So you can't come in and go like, hey, I would like to get 20% stronger but I'd also like to lose 10% body fat at the same time. Mm -hmm. that, that will sabotage yeah. your training. And those goals are totally valid. Like, of course you want to be stronger. And of course you want to have a good body composition. But it's like, we need to be really realistic with like, okay, let's maybe work on one a little bit more than the other for now. Because if you try and accomplish both yep. really hard, you're probably going to fail at both. And then you're not adding value. Yeah. Yeah. That's a really good one. That's a great point. Mm -hmm. You will fail at both. So there is a chronology that needs to occur there. Mm -hmm. In our world, everybody wants to get stronger and everybody wants to look better. And mm -hmm. that is okay. Mm -hmm. But it is hard to do both at the exact same time. It's certainly hard to like put the pedal to the metal on both. Yeah. At some point, that'll come back to bite you. So, yeah. so that's my first one. Okay, good one. Are you getting enough calories? Are you eating enough to accomplish the goal? Yeah. Okay. What about you? Mine is, and this I think is maybe a little more common in beginners, is you don't plan to train. I say the word plan because I mean, you can't just say, I'm training three days a week. Like, no, you have to determine which days of the week you are lifting. You have to know what time you're going to go in so that you can kind of create your day around it. Not trying to disrupt your life, but it's like you have to pack your workout clothes or you have to have a place to train in your house. You have to eat for it. You have to make sure you sleep for it. Like you have to actually walk the talk of being a person who trains. And by that, I mean, you put it in your schedule and you protect that time. That's it. Yep. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. Because if you don't do it, then you don't do it. <laughs> That's right. This is one of those where I want to be clear. I, the last thing I want to do is be hypocritical here, but this has been a big struggle for me as the businesses that I have owned over the years have continued to grow. Mm-hmm. I have learned that I have to train. I don't necessarily enjoy training early in the morning, but I have to train early in the morning or too many things can happen to derail training. Mm -hmm. And so I've had my executive assistant go in and my schedule on my calendar from now till Jesus comes back is blocked for all my training days. And Love I it. actually have blocked it out. I blocked mine out. Mine are blocked out six days a week nice. because we've tried to develop the habit of doing something. So on days that we're not actually like Rachel and I aren't actually squatting and deadlifting, we might just get up and do a walk, yes. do a 30 minute walk around the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. It's really good. It's good time for us. We get to talk. It's good quality time for us. Mm -hmm. Maybe it aids in recovery, but mostly it just like it develops the habit for us. And for those of us at Block, you know, we live using things like Calendly where mm -hmm. people can go in and they can schedule a phone call with me. I have to have it blocked out or somebody will schedule a phone call during that time yeah. or something. And so yep. uh, that's been big for me and it's made a big that's difference really good. Uh, recently in my Another own Another thing that I, that you said that I really like is you also plan for the flexibility because for this to work, you also, you really have to be able to adapt to your life. So you block it for six days yep. a week and maybe like you only lift four days a week, but you still have created the space for that's yourself right. to be flexible when you need to. And I think that's important for people who lift three days yep. a week or four days a week is like, you kind of have to go into the week, like no matter what, I am lifting three days per week. And you just know that you might like swing them around that's between right. the days, but by the end of the week, you've lifted three days and that's awesome. So planning and then planning yep. for the flexibility. Yeah. I've, um, I've told my clients that lots of times where they 
I don't care. Sometimes you'll, they'll send you on our software, they'll send me a, a DM and they'll be like, I'm so sorry I missed Thursday's workout. Is it okay if I do it tomorrow on Friday? And we're like, yeah, of, of course. course. Like all yeah. I really care about if you're scheduled for four days or if you're scheduled for three days is that you get those in. If they're, yeah. if everything gets pushed back a day or, or pushed forward a day, it's, it's typically it's okay. So that's a good one. I have a client right now who is similar to the issue of not eating enough calories. Another thing that I see with a lot of people is over-exercising, mm-hmm. is sabotaging your training. Now, this isn't exactly fair. You do that. Yeah, you're an over-exerciser. Yeah, I'm bad. <laughs> you know, I see a lot of people who potentially have some body dysmorphia will almost always struggle with either some sort of eating disorder or an over-exerciser. Mm-hmm. And uh, those are the two places that I see it most predominantly. Now, I have a client that I'm thinking about who he is not this way at all. He is training for an Ironman right now for an mm-hmm. Ironman triathlon. And dude, it is every day we go into the gym and we're just trying to pull weight off the bar as slow as we can. Yeah. But he's bonking because yeah. as he's ramping up into competitive season, he just can't get strong. Now, here's the deal. His primary goal is to perform well at triathlons right. and not necessarily be strong. He understands the value of strength for triathlons. But when I get somebody like that, who's really like a competitive endurance sport athlete, you can really see the impact that it has on their strength training mm-hmm. in the gym. I mean, you know, this guy, he's probably lost. He's lost about 20% of his wow. strength, maybe 25% of it. I mean, it's a pretty significant, and with with not much change in body weight, mm-hmm. you know, he's maybe lost five or six pounds from all the, all the exercise. And again, for him, very tough to eat enough calories, do all those sort of things. But if you're a chronic over-exerciser, if you're the kind of person who you want to get strong, but you also need to run five miles every morning mm-hmm. to feel like you did something, that is sabotaging your training. Mm-hmm. And it's very much related to the previous ones we've talked about. Yeah, I had... Something like that written on my list. And it's, it's actually something I was doing on yesterday. I uploaded my workout to Matt yesterday. I did like a million bench press sets. But like my arms were just like destroyed from all the non-gym stuff I was doing. And your response is perfect. It's like, good. You're doing fun stuff. That's exactly what you should be doing. But like... Yeah. And you're like, I went kayaking. I was yeah, like, that sounds cool. Fun. I live in Southern California. It's gorgeous yeah. all the time. Like, you got to go and do that. <laughs> yeah. But like, you have to remember that yeah. it's, it's the it's only all thing coming you have from the same in Southern bank account. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's right. <laughs> We've got mountains full right. of fire and stuff, you know. <laughs> but okay. Matt has no <laughs> idea where I live. <laughs> that is not. I know. That <laughs> is true. It is true. She lives in the one area of California, the only area of California that doesn't have homeless people shooting up heroin in front of children. We're in a nice little area. So <laughs> we just have rich people do little that. Little area between LA and San Diego. That's, it's that's, not that's homeless right. people. It's rich people Sorry. who do that. <laughs> so I had programmed you. I've done this a little bit with you lately on bench press to say, rather than programming your sets and reps, I say, give me a total of... 30 reps at this weight, Mm -hmm. right? And I don't care how many sets it takes. And you would have normally gotten that taken care of in like four sets or five sets. And it took you like seven or eight sets yesterday. And you're like, yeah, but I did this and I kayaked a bunch. I was like, cool, that's fine. Like you're out and it's nice and who cares? Yeah. Awesome. So like the way I summarize that up for how you could sabotage is if you're really kind of narrow-minded in what your expectations are. So like if I went in to that day to bench yesterday, I was like, sweet, I got to do 30 reps of 140. I'm going to knock this out in three sets of 10. And I was just like, my arms were too tired to do that. So at that point, I could have either been like, like this program isn't working. Like I'm supposed to be getting stronger so that I can be better at all the things that I do outside the gym. Clearly, it's not working like this is terrible. Or I could kind of take a full survey of the circumstances and be like, oh, okay, I'm tired because of this. And, you know, I'm still able to complete my workout. I have flexibility in what the accomplishments are and what my expectations are. That's fine. So that's a real important mindset sabotage there is like keeping a full awareness of what the circumstances are around what you actually do and around what your expectations are. Or else like, Like you might think that strength is going to cure everything and like (laughs) 
I was even chuckling as I was kayaking because it was like really hard. <laughs> it's like I thought I was supposed to be <laughs> strong enough for this, and I was like, okay, this is the second time I've done this. Like it's okay. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, you can. You just have to be really careful not to have like really, um, like bipolar expectations. Like this is. Yeah, I'm failing rigid. all over the place or I'm succeeding and I'm the best ever. Yeah. Like you really have to like keep yourself in check. Yeah. If that makes sense. Good. Yeah. Yeah. And you have to think about too, like when it's programmed, I program it that way for you right now for yeah. that very reason. Perfect. Like, mm -hmm. yeah, you know, there's some flexibility in the programming. You know, if you were supposed to hit three sets of five and you couldn't, it's a little more like, okay, why didn't you hit three sets of five? And, you know, I talk to my clients about this all the time. Like, well, let's talk about what's going on. Like, oh, I... Mm -hmm. kayak for eight hours yesterday you're like well that makes sense then that's yeah. fine you're fine you know? <laughs> yeah and so but the way you had it like i don't care if it takes eight sets right now or four sets it doesn't right all that's the same so i will piggyback off of that and say i think one of the biggest problems i see especially for people who don't have a coach is program hopping mm -hmm. something doesn't work for a day mm -hmm. or two and they change the pro they're like it's the programming right that doesn't work no nah, mm -hmm. it's probably not it's probably not the program right? Mm -hmm. There are some bad programs out there, but we've talked about it many times on the podcast that is so far secondary to consistency and technique. And mm -hmm. so some of it is people are inherently pessimistic and when they have a bad day or two bad days, which might, it could be outside stress, it could be fatigue from the program. Like there are lots of things that could be occurring and they're so pessimistic, they're like, well, the program is the problem, and so I need to change the program. Mm. But more often than not, I actually see people who are addicted to variation. Mm -hmm. Like the world, this is one of the things about, I really am very thankful for CrossFit and what CrossFit has brought us in the fitness world. It has exposed millions and millions of people to barbells. But it's also sort of gotten a lot of people, millions of people probably addicted to constant variation. Yeah. And good training we say it's simple hard and effective it's well another word for simple which is not as good of a marketing tagline is boring right <laughs> it's kind of boring it's kind of monotonous it's kind of do the same thing that you did last time but add a little bit of weight this time or add a little bit of totally. volume this time and when you hop programs you are sabotaging your training mm -hmm. almost every time even when you hop from a good program to a good program Mm -hmm. you're sabotaging your training because they totally. build on each other right so we did that podcast just a couple weeks ago about um you know when when the small increment isn't the minimum effective dose occasionally mm -hmm. like once every few years you have a client that's done this and, and sort of done the grinding thing for so long and made the little incremental change and the little incremental change and the little incremental change for years and they're like, they just need sort of a completely new program and they kind of need to change their goals and move a different direction. And every once in a great while, every several years, that's perfectly okay. It's perfectly acceptable. Mm -hmm. But I see yeah. people all the time that read the new workout in muscle and fitness right. or they read the new thing on tnation.com or whatever. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm gonna try that thing. Well, like, you, they don't give it enough time to work or not work or really matter. And so yeah, program hopping is not a good thing. Yeah. And that's, I feel like that's something we're really aware of since we've been doing this. I've been doing this now for, I don't know, 12 years. You've been doing this for like 60 years. <laughs> Just kidding. Not 60 right. years, but a whole lot of years. You're much younger than that. But like, you can really see the value of being 23 consistent. Years. 23? That's awesome. That's really yeah. cool. Yeah. 23 years. Yeah. Coach. Yeah. Actually, this just came up in jujitsu this morning. We've been working this certain guard pass and there are like different ways that you can make this move work. And our coach said in a really nice and like eloquent way, you just got to try harder sometimes and not give up and keep trying. <laughs> and he was saying like, you know, when you're actually drilling yeah. with someone, like it might not work the first time, try it again the second time, try harder. Don't just abandon it and go to something different because then you're just like doing a lot of different things that aren't working versus being persistent and actually adapting to the situation and making it work. So you have to like, give it consistency to get any real feedback as to whether it's working or not. Yeah, that's a good one. Yeah, this is my biggest frustration as a parent with my kids is that somehow, and I, I was never wired this way, they are wired with the I can'ts. Like, you know, you're doing your math homework, so I can't do it. And they shut down. 
And I was like, I was never that way. Like, well, we got to learn how to be a problem solvers, guys. We got to problem solve. Yeah. Like, you don't want to always do whatever the thing is, but we st stay with math. Like, what good is it to just do math? Like, I don't want to sit down and do an entire sheet of paper that's like single digit addition. Four plus four is this. Five plus six is that. Like, like you want to do math just above your reach, just a tiny little bit above your reach and you're going to fail and you're going to fail several times in a row and maybe you're going to fail lots of times in a row but eventually you're going to get it and that's how you step up and get better and training is exactly the same thing like we do this thing that that's what we're doing we're stressing our body in a way that it hasn't been stressed before mm -hmm. and forcing our body to adapt but and it's the same thing as you're trying to like pass guard and you haven't done it before and you're like i screwed it up i screwed it up i screwed it up and eventually like you develop the motor pattern and you do the thing right and then it's late right. and, you, and you've done it. Now you start to work on the next more advanced thing. And so this is the problem with the program hopping is that you kind of get into the I can'ts. Well, yeah. Texas method didn't work for me. Well, 531 right. didn't work for me. Well, blocked and well, hold on. The common denominator of all these programs not working is you, <laughs> which means it probably wasn't the program, yeah. was it? Being narrow minded again. So, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's good. That's, that's good. Right. Okay. My next one is that you don't track your progress. So if, and by that, mm. I mean, you need to track PRs. You need to track the date at which you hit certain PRs, one, three, five rep maxes, whatever, two and four, three, three sets across, like PRs at certain body weights, because you're going to have lots of moments where you're questioning, like, is this even worth it? Am I even getting better? Is it time to program hop? <laughs> And you need to have actual right. data to draw you back to that reality. And that's one of the great things about lifting is that there is reality because we know the weight on the bar. So if you don't track your progress, if you're not watching your metrics or keeping a workout log or giving yourself any realistic concept of how you're doing, you're going to convince yourself to believe that nothing is working, especially if you have that, that mindset right. already where you're just like, man, ah, this isn't working. This is rubbish. Like, no, like, look at the data. Look at where you were right. last year, look at where you were two years ago, whatever, give yourself some sort of progress to, to be mindful of. Yep. Yeah. I've said this lots of times of the single greatest metric that we track is PRs. It's the personal record. And it used to actually bother me, especially when I was a really intense competitive power lifter, where I really just tracked like my one rep max squat and my one rep max deadlift and those things used to bother me a little bit when I'd have a client that'd be like, oh, this is my squat PR in knee sleeves, and this is my squat PR in, in knee wraps, and this is my squat PR in whole four on my belt and whole five on my belt. And now I actually like that stuff. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's a little neurotic. <laughs> I don't do that, but it doesn't bother me at all when a client, when a client does it mm -hmm. because, you know, they're like, oh, this is an under 40 PR. This is a PR for my 30s. This is a PR under 220 pounds or over 200, like whatever the thing is, like perfect, mm -hmm. like, chase prs but you can't do that if you don't track what you're doing so prs yeah. matter you should know that one rep max the three rep max the five rep max at all the different weight increments at you know whatever those things are and because it's so valuable to go back and look when you hit all those prs mm -hmm. you'll go and training is like this right you'll go months at some point and not hit a single pr mm -hmm. and then you'll get to a point where you'll go a couple of months and you'll hit a ton of PRs and mm -hmm. you want to be able to go back and look and go, well, what was I doing to be able to hit those PRs? Like yeah. it really makes, helps make sense of the programming. And yeah. So, yeah. That tracking is incredibly important. Yeah. I would totally much rather it's hang good. out with someone who has like a long list of PRs, even if they're like kind of creative PRs than someone who's just like, nope, my one rep max has not gone up ever. And this is the worst. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sounds like a much more yeah, fun I person to hang out with. To start. I did that. Yeah, for sure. I don't, um, like I said, I, I don't keep, you know, I don't keep like, oh, this were, I had a PR in my blue knee sleeves and this is my PR in my black knee sleeves. And I don't do that necessarily, <laughs> but I did change quite a bit when I started doing West Side style training because West Side does so many variations on the lift. So yeah. for example, so you would obviously have, here's my deficit deadlift PR, my rack pull PR. So mm -hmm. uh, uh, let's use those. So deficit deadlift. I had a deficit deadlift PR in a one inch deficit, a two inch deficit and a three inch deficit. And a rack pull PR at every individual hole on the rack. You know, I have clients all the time. We talked about this in our press podcast last week, week before last, about, you know, pin presses. Like they do press lockouts, you know, from the mouth, from the nose, from the eyes, from the eyebrows, from the top of the head, from two inches above the head. 
like obviously you should keep PRs for all those. It's way easier to do a, a mm-hmm. press lockout from two inches above the head mm-hmm. than it is to do it from your nose, mm-hmm. right? And so be able to track those things so that we can go back and revisit. And we want to be able to we want to be able to go back and do that exact same thing again so we can test. Mm-hmm. I don't want to just go back and do a press lockout six weeks later from two inches above the head and not really have the same setup I did last time. I want the same setup so I can see that I actually made progress or didn't. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's, it makes a big difference for sure. I like that because then you're actually tracking what you're doing because you don't go for yeah. 135 rep max very often. So now you're keeping a record of the, th- the way that you're actually training. I like that. Yep. I am going to change. I'm going to change directions just a little bit. I'm going to give you a, maybe my first bro science one. So mm. and I'm going to go back to nutrition. Um, if it fits your macros has been really popular for the last 10 or 15 years now, and it works fantastic. It's tracking nutrition, just like we talked to, just like tracking PRs, right? Uh, it works great and it makes it a science. But from what I understand, most of the literature has said that if you, if you get your macros the way you're supposed to, it really doesn't matter mm-hmm. where you get them from or the quality of food. And you see a lot of people that eat their macros and they, you know, they, their carbs come from, pop tarts and they you know whatever right there's too much alcohol and 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 my experience both as a lifter and as a coach tells me that quality food matters Mm -hmm. and if i if i get my macros but i have too many of my calories are coming from alcohol or i hit my macros just perfect and i'm eating bacon double cheeseburgers from mcdonald's i feel like shit Mm-hmm. And when I eat high quality food, high quality protein, lots of greens, lots of water, you know, lots of no calorie mm-hmm. drinks, even if the calorie, total calorie consumption from day to day is the same, my training is significantly better with high quality food. And I, I can't prove that. Maybe there's some stuff that's starting to come out in the data, but I'm telling you, my experience has clearly shown that it makes a difference totally feel a lot so better I think, less bloated I think sleep better feel better yeah that's right yeah total yeah your I, digestion you're i'm not, sure your i'm sure it's on another up, level bloated. above bro science yeah i think there's probably real science on it but i'm totally with you i always notice a difference of like if it's just yeah. eating calories for calories or if i'm eating nutrients for nutrients you know totally different that's right yeah and i'd be the first to admit too that even though there is probably some real science behind it I understand that there's also probably a significant placebo effect that occurs that when I'm eating healthy, when I'm eating that way, I'm thinking of myself as an athlete. Mm-hmm. I'm thinking about eating mm-hmm. for fuel for the training. It just sort of feels better. Yeah. And so whether it's actually true or not actually doesn't matter, right? It's it's kind of some of those things when we talked about like, well, does massage really help? Does foam rolling really help? Does Russian stem really help. The ice baths really help. You know what? If you feel like they make you better, even though there's no data to support that, like why that's do it. That's great. Yeah. You know, you're taking like, care of yourself. That's right. I don't know if a sauna makes you lift more weights tomorrow, but if you feel like you're taking care of yourself and you're acting like an athlete, and it's kind of that act as if I think that's a big part of it. I think mm-hmm. nutrition plays a big role there for sure. That's a good one. Okay. I have one more. And that is when you compare yourself to others. You can Ooh, that's good. really make yourself feel bad about yourself. <laughs> like I have a lot of <laughs> lifters that I look up to or that I respect. But if I start comparing my numbers to them or if I compare my body to them or anything like that, it really can let you just go down these rabbit holes of your own insecurities. So I think it's good to kind of celebrate other people who might be a little bit better than you, but don't compare yourself to them because you are on your own journey. Sounds really Southern California of me, but like, <laughs> you know, you're coming right. from somewhere different. You have your own mindset. You have your own genetics. Like mom and dad gave you what you got and their parents gave them what they got and they had their totally own history. So don't don't fall into that trap of thinking that you should be as good as someone else or you should look like someone else. Like you have to yeah. enjoy your training for you and what you're doing. That's a big one. Yeah, that's good. Mm-hmm. That's good. One of my last ones would be, and this is another really obvious one, but I, I want to make sure that it's mentioned is 
you got to have good sleep hygiene. Oh, yes. Sleep is so important. It might be more important than nutrition, mm -hmm. certainly as important. And it's not just about, you know, we've gone from this sort of old adage of, well, you need eight hours a, a night, which is probably true and probably really good. But sleep hygiene, I think the concept of going to bed at the same time every night and waking up at the same time, and everybody knows that I'm kind of an early to bed, early to rise kind of guy, but I don't think it has to be that. I just think it needs to be if you go to bed at midnight every night and get up at 8 a.m. every morning, I think it's perfectly fine. Let's say you got your eight hours, but mm -hmm. there's something about finding that schedule and doing the thing and then having good sleep hygiene, right? So yeah. not checking the phone in bed and making sure it's cool in your room and making sure it's dark. We have an entire podcast episode on that in the past. It's made a big difference in my life. You know, I have a CPAP. That's another one that for you, mostly for the males, but certainly I mean, my mom, lots of people have um, CPAPs that are, that are not males. Um, it has changed my life. My sleep is so much better. And there's an app that my CPAP uses that tells me what the quality of sleep was the next morning. So very Ooh. first thing I do, I wake up like anybody else. I got to go pee. I'm completely blind. As I've talked about in the podcast <laughs> in the past, I walk into the bathroom and I sit on the toilet because there's no way I could hit it <laughs> without my contacts in. So I sit on the toilet but I, uh, what's it called? I'm nearsighted, right? So I can see the things that are near, but I can't see yeah. the things that are far. So uh, the first thing I do is I sit down and pee and I pull up my sleep app and I look at <laughs> how the quality of sleep and it tells me how long I slept. And it's awesome because it knows really how long I slept. Mm -hmm. It knows based on my breathing pattern, how long I slept, how many times I adjusted my mask in the night. It tells wow. me the number, right? Man, how many creepy. times I adjusted the mask in the night. It tells me like, you know, how many times I took it off. So it also will know like how many, if I got up to the bathroom. Or that. But now I've heard of people who struggle with sleep and I've never really struggled with insomnia. Uh, occasionally I've had, you know, like crazy stuff going on in my life and there's just your brain's going nuts, but you can get obsessive about those things. And then if your sleep is not right. great, you get a little more obsessed about, well, so this thing will score me on a score of zero to a hundred. And so I'm like, uh, if I'm in the nineties, I'm great. And I was like, oh, it was at 87 last night. I wonder what's going on. Then occasionally I'll have like a bad night of sleep. For me, if I see that I had a bad night of sleep, it doesn't like wreck my day. It actually mm. tends to tell me like, hey, I should probably take a nap mm. today. I should see if I can get a one hour nap in mid-afternoon. But that good sleep hygiene has changed my life. And as I get older, you know, when I was in college, I could stay up all night long, most of the night. I could yeah. drink, I could whatever. And then I'd train the next day. And I'm yeah. like, now, like... <laughs> I don't sleep. I drink. I'm like, I can't fucking train at all. No, <laughs> I don't know how you, uh, how you handle that, but just kidding. I know exactly how you handle it. <laughs> doesn't go well total, for you. <laughs> total wreck. Like there's, yeah, I'm in a really bad state if I stay up past 11 and then I'm in a really bad state if I go to bed on time, but if I drink too much and then if I drink too much and go to bed past 11, like I just need to go to the hospital. Like, it's so bad. I cannot handle it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I've seen that out of you a couple times at this point. I'm kind of the same way. It's sort of weird that I don't feel good if I get like five hours of sleep, four hours of sleep. I, most people don't. Mm -hmm. And I don't feel good if I have a little bit too much to drink. But if I don't get enough sleep and I have oh, a little too much to drink, it's so it bad. is awful. And it doesn't, it's not, you know, again, there were times when maybe I, you know, I'd, been hung over when I was 22 and you're recovered by three 30 in the afternoon the next day. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And now in my forties, <laughs> my hangovers last six days. Yeah. My training is ruined for the week. Oh yeah. It's like, and I remember and being hopeful it, during hangovers when I was younger, but now there's no hope. It's just like, okay, well if this is how life <laughs> right. is like, I don't know. <laughs> I, I know. Maybe, maybe I should just put myself out of my misery. <laughs> That's right. So sorry. Yeah. Bad. You know, some of those are obviously super obvious, right? Yeah. You don't stay up over drinking and not sleeping, but I'm still surprised at how many people, you know, look at their phone all night in bed, check their texts several times or their emails in the middle of the night, have that, mm -hmm. have that cell phone light in their face, watch TV in bed, go to bed at all kinds of different times of the night. Uh, you know, the, and so just even if, so if it's not, if you're somebody just like, I don't, and, I, and that's not us either. Like, well, it's not common for me to drink too much and not sleep. That's right. A, that's a once a very year that I, I'm like, I drank a little too much and didn't sleep enough. Yeah. But it's been very important. Like I go to bed early. Rachel and I were on a date the other night and, uh, and I remember it was like, I was like, man, it's about time for what time is this? We, I'm, we got on this like nice restaurant and had some drinks and some food. And I looked at, I was like, man, I'm sleepy. It was 647. <laughs> PM. 
<laughs> you know what we did? Got in the car, drove home, went upstairs, and at 7.17, <laughs> I was in bed. <laughs> now, okay. I didn't go to sleep. You know, I read a little bit. Mm -hmm. I read a little Wall Street Journal or whatever. And then yeah. but by 8 p.m., I was night, night. out. It was glorious. <laughs> it's so good. I love it. It was glorious. <laughs> we could so, talk about sleep for a long all time. All of those are the best. I, <laughs> yeah, we could. We could. So, so those are, there's a big handful of things yeah. that you could be doing to sabotage your training. Some are probably more obvious than others, things like over drinking, not having mm -hmm. enough calories, over exercising, but also making sure that you're doing those things we talked about, about making sure that training adds value to your life, that you're yeah. dedicated to the thing, that you're not a program hopper, that you're, all of those things, those are the ones that tend to sneak in and get people, especially the ones who have trained for a while, mm -hmm. that know that they're not supposed to, obviously, you're not supposed to have seven glasses of whiskey before we go to bed. But if you've done a program for three weeks, you're like, ah, I don't really like this program, and you switch programs, you do it again four weeks later, things like that are the things that'll sneak in and get you and really sabotage your training. And so yep. I think that's really important. And the last one off of this, and I really don't mean this to be a commercial, but if you don't have a coach or you don't have someone see you lift at least on occasion, mm -hmm. you are sabotaging your training. And so um, this is not a plea to get you to join Barbell Logic Online Coaching. Um, you know, for us, I've talked about this lots of time. One of the things I've really missed about 2020 with the year of COVID is I haven't been able to get in-person coaching from mm -hmm. you and from Andrew mm -hmm. and from Cody Miller and those people that I respect that I love going and doing these seminars because I get good coaching for me. It's yeah. really enjoyable. Mm -hmm. um, and so even if you're somebody who doesn't get online coaching from us, and we would love for you to do that and get coaching every single day, somebody needs to get their eyes on you. I like being coached by my wife. My wife mm -hmm. is a good coach mm -hmm. and she'll be a little bit hesitant about it. But if I ask her, I'm like, you know, please watch this and let me know. She's got a great eye. And so it's, yeah, you need to have somebody watching what you're doing. So, you know, even if that is just videoing yourself doing your workouts, checking your form, occasionally posting form checks, going mm -hmm. to experience, things like that. You've got all those options. You've got to make sure that the form is right. Um, mm -hmm. If it's not, you're sabotaging your training. Yeah, I dig it. Cool. Cool. That's your list? Yes, that's everything. So I hope you maybe connected with something in there that will lead to more success towards whatever successful training means to you. I know it's a little bit different, but I just want training to really be a good right. part of people's lives. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. And it's different. You know, it's different. We've talked about this before where some people that training is like a spoonful of medicine and some people need it. Um, mm -hmm. Saturday, I think it was Saturday. My wife and I trained. We had a really good session with squatted and deadlifted. And then I've got all these, you've seen it. I've got a kind of a line of lower body accessory equipment now, right? Where I've got all these, you know, leg extension, leg curl and a reverse hyper and a glute ham raise and a echo bike. And so we'll, we'll do the main lifts and then we'll go out and we'll just hammer some circuits on this stuff. And after I got done training, she said, she said, she's like, God, you're like a different person. Aww. She's like, before training this morning, she's like, you were an asshole. <laughs> she was like, you're kind of like biting everybody's head off. And, uh, and then you trained and she's just like, you're just like fun and you're telling <laughs> jokes and you're relaxed. And so for me, I need that. And, uh, I, you know, I think if you're not careful, it's certainly another way that to sabotage training is is if the external stressors in your life are through the roof, mm -hmm. then that will absolutely sabotage your training. That's the, I am constantly looking at that as a coach for my clients, trying to pick up on if they are overstressed, it is imperative that I make training enjoyable for them. Absolutely. If they are super stressed and then I'm trying to make them chase PRs and then they miss the PRs oh, in the gym. that is so bad. It just is a snowball effect. Of, it's bad. So bad. And so instead, I'm like, hey, let's go. Well, you and I did this not that long ago. Yeah. It wasn't really stress, external stress. It was injury. You had enough sort of things that had built up that then I'm programming you and you're going in. And because of your injuries, you can't hit the numbers that I programmed or the right. things that I'm, I'm asking you to do. And you're like, everything hurts. I'm like, whoa, hold on. No. Let's figure out a way to make training more enjoyable again. Right. And let's, let's just do that for a while. So you, and for me, that's a huge, it's training is the thing that I need that will help me process that stress and be the husband that I need to be, the father that mm -hmm. I need to be, the CEO that I need to be, those things. And training is so much better than whiskey mm -hmm. or strip clubs or cocaine, or I don't do those, <laughs> but the whiskey, yes. But the, I hear those know, things are whatever. great. <laughs> and so it's the, yeah, I hear those. I mean, it sounds like an awesome weekend, but, uh, but again, it, those will derail your training and training is a great de-stressor for, for me, for sure. So 
Yeah. Yeah. You got to keep those things in check for sure. And sometimes you can't do anything about the stress. Sometimes right. you get sued and getting sued is stressful. <laughs> yeah. And, it, and uh, I know from experience and <laughs> training makes you be able to process that better. Yeah. And so yeah. it is, but you can't be in the middle of a divorce or losing your job or getting sued and also training for a powerlifting meet. That is not going to huh. work very often. No, your body you can't really handle that. Enjoyable. Yeah. You can't. It can't. Because like you said, it all comes from the same place. It's all the same account. Yeah. And you get that budget. So think about that budget. Yeah. So many things we talked about were things that you do outside of training that actually prove that you're taking care of yourself. So if you maintain the habit of really training, then you start to maintain habits of eating well, sleeping well. And so that when you go through these difficult times, I'm not going to say like training fixes everything. Like you just are a lifter and you can handle whatever. Like, no, shit's going to get really tough. But it's like, if you can maintain some good habits when you're going through those really stressful periods, like it's only going to help. Yeah. I'm, I'm on a soapbox. Okay. Yeah, I'm going to give a quick shout out <laughs> as we wrap this up. Um, so I, I, th I think I might have mentioned this one other time, but uh, Dr. Jonathan Sullivan has recorded a podcast series for us that'll be coming out here in just a couple of weeks on Barbell Health, Barbell Prescription. And God, it's, it's I listened to the first episode yesterday and it was so freaking Ooh, so good. I'm so excited. Uh, he and Noah Hayden did it. And it's just, you know, it's that, that idea of training to not be the sick aging phenotype, but to be the healthy, like we're all humans, but you can look at two different people and they've lived life completely different ways. And I want to be one of those people who are training to be healthy, to be that athlete of aging that Dr. Sullivan talks about. And so super excited about that series coming out in uh, early October. So stay tuned for that. And it really just builds on this. It's like how to have that lifestyle, that kind of holistic, W-H-O-L, holistic lifestyle of training as part of this thing I do to be healthy and, mm -hmm. and have a great quality of life. So I like it. Uh, so we told you what not to do today yeah. <laughs> and coming up soon. Sully is going to tell you about what to do. Awesome. I love it. All right. Uh, I'm going to go do some cocaine and uh, shut the show down. So, no, just kidding. So, <laughs> the strippers are waiting for me. Uh, actually, so, uh... got, it, no, actually, in fact, the contractor's in my backyard installing the hot tub right now. Bullet, true, true story. <laughs> so, so he's good. actually back there right now installing the, installing the hot tub. So, hey, this has been another episode of the Barbell Logic Podcast. Thank you for listening. We love a five star review. Yeah. Again, we are so close to a thousand five star reviews. We'd love to have a five star review on iTunes. And you can catch us anywhere that you listen to podcasts. Share us with a friend or family member, coworker. Yeah, we have a lot of fun doing the show. So thanks for doing the show with me today, yeah. Nikki. And we'll Good see time. you next Monday. Bye, everybody. Bye.